Um, so we are in a series called Seeds. I forgot to bring the book up with me, but we're in a series called Seeds, and it's actually all of our life groups also are uh, focused on this one topic. So for the next eight weeks, we're talking about seeds, and it's a theme throughout the Bible this week. Uh, we're in week three of that. And if you haven't yet joined a life group, I'm going to encourage you to get in one. You can stop by the Connection Center. All of the groups that are still open uh, are listed. And so you can see what day of the week, what time of the day, if there's a group that works for you. Uh, we encourage you to get into a group and kind of dialogue about this content. Um, and the idea behind this whole series is that tomorrow starts today. And there's growth for us. And we can grow if we're willing. So there's all this, the potential is in this seed that Jesus has given us. And um, there's opportunity for growth and development, but it matters what we put into our life and what we do with it in order to see the difference and to see that fruit. And so that's kind of what we've been talking about. In week one, um, we talked about how we should focus on the seed and not the fruit. So, you know, if you want to, we always talk about planting an apple tree. We will never plant an apple tree, but we've talked about it. Or a nectarine tree. We like, well, my family used to like green apples and nectarines. So when we go to Costco, I'm always tempted by the nectarine tree. And then I'm like, but Tiff is going to be five years to get any fruit on. And I don't, I just, I'm not that, I'm not going to do it. You know, like I'll plant tomatoes and kill them before the summer's over. Cause I'm tired of watering them. <laughs> I'm not going to see fruit from a tree five years from now. Uh, but when you, when you're talking about seeds, you can't focus on, you don't have the apple tree yet. So you have to take care of the seed first. You have to invest in the seed and what it needs before you even get the apples or the nectarines that you're looking for. So we talked about that in week two, we talked about, um, focusing on the seed is key for the soil because if you put a seed in bad soil nothing's gonna happen you know or it might just produce like nasty weak fruit that you're gonna throw in the trash anyway like you don't want that so you can go back and watch those messages you can find them online this week what we're talking about is that you cannot care for the soil without understanding what threatens the seed. So you need to know what the seed needs in order to provide the soil that's gonna, you know, we have a lot of clay soil around here. I know that because I took my kids to a farm class and I was there, there's a lot of clay soil. And you can grow things in clay, but you just gotta know what to do with it in order for it to be able to produce that kind of fruit. And so we're still gonna be in Matthew uh, 13, that's where we were last week. And Pastor Elliot kind of, he talked about this a lot. Uh, so we were in the beginning of Matthew 13. We're going to be in the later section of Matthew 13 today. But last week we opened with, it was a parable of parables or a story of stories. Because as Jesus is talking, he's talking to a large crowd of people. And he talks about this seed that falls on, the farmer went out to sow the seed and it landed on all kinds of different, the rocky path, um, the, the dirt and the soil. Some of them grew up and then some of them uh, lasted forever and some of them were uprooted. So he kind of talks, it's a story of stories within that. And what happens is at the end, he said, Jesus said to the crowd, whoever has ears to hear. And so that was kind of our big point last week. You have to have ears to hear. And Jesus wasn't talking when he was talking to the crowd. He wasn't talking about our auditory ability, <laughs> you know, whether or not our ears work, but he was talking about that spiritual ability spiritual ears to hear the words of truth, to hear the wisdom, to hear um, the words from the one who created it all. That's what he's talking about. Ears to hear what I am saying to you. Because how many of you know that we as people, we can sound real smart, but not really be able to hear what Jesus is saying. <laughs> you know, you, like I've been that person. We've been that person. We've met that person. People can be real passionate. We can be real passionate and passionately off course. Anybody ever been there? Like you're gung-ho in the wrong direction. Uh, people can say a lot of things. We can say a lot of things that sound so profound and so deep and like they're helpful. But really only the things that Jesus has breathed life into are going to be the things that last and bear fruit. And so that's what we want. We want to be able to hear those things from the one who created it all. So today we're going to look at that explanation that Jesus gave because the disciples, he's, Jesus is talking to a loud crowd, large crowd of people, but his disciples are also there. And the disciples pulled them aside later and they're like, can you explain that to us? <laughs> we don't get it. It seems like I read it and I'm like, it seems, it seems pretty simple, guys. I don't know why you don't get it. <laughs> but you know, uh, so Jesus is kind and he says, okay, let me explain this to you. So we're going to pick it up in Matthew 13 verses 18 through 23. I'm going to read the whole thing, but then we'll break it up into sections later. Jesus says, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. 
When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So in other words, Jesus is saying there's no soil in that person's life for the seed to land in. There are too many biases against Jesus. Pastor Elliot talked about that last week. Biases against the church, biases against Jesus. You either grew up with them or someone put them on you and now they're, they're a barrier that you have to overcome in order to get close to the Lord. And so Jesus is saying there's nowhere for his word, the seed of his word to stick. Verse 20 says, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. So in other words, this person didn't know what to do when life got difficult with Jesus as Lord of their life. They, gave, they were excited about Jesus, but when things got hard, they didn't know what to do. If you've ever, like I said, I've tried to grow tomatoes. I have successfully grown tomatoes and peppers. I just kill them before the season's over because I'm, I'm over it. But I, so when you grow them, if you've ever tried 2020, how many of you guys tried to grow fruit in 2020? Anything? I bought the things. I did it before then, but I definitely did it during 2020. Uh, you know, you buy the container and it's got the lid and you can put your little pods in there and I put the tomatoes in. If you grow things inside, you have to make them hardy before you put them outside. You know, so if you're growing them inside, that, I, I did, I Googled it, guys. Okay, so I'm a professional from Google. <laughs> Come on. Um, but when the seedlings are, are just sprouting, you rub your hands over them in order to create resistance like wind so that they're stuck. Because when the plant feels that, they go, oh, I got to get stronger. If that's, what, if that's what the world is like, if that's what the life is like out there, I've got to get stronger. So the stalk actually gets thicker so that you can build up its resistance to the outside before you ever put it outside. And so Jesus is saying some, some people are going to hear the word. They're going to receive it with joy, but they're not going to be strong enough. They're not going to be strengthened. They're not going to put the work in in order to get strengthened to face the world with me is what Jesus is saying there. Okay, so those that fell away were not properly strengthened. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So again, the seed was growing. It was doing well, but then something else was given more water. Something else was given more attention. Something else was given more care. And that healthy seed then was starved. And then verse 23, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. How many of you guys want 100 times what's been sown into your life? Like That's what I'm talking about. I, I want that. So Jesus says it's the one who hears the word and understands it. So you can write this down if you're taking notes. You cannot care for the soil without understanding what threatens the seed. You cannot care for the soil without understanding what threatens the seed. So the biblical word for understanding is that word revelation. You know, you've, you've heard of the Bible book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. It means understanding. <laughs> understanding what Jesus is doing in the world and in the church. So uh, the biblical word for understanding is revelation. It's a spiritual truth that becomes clear. It's basically, it's that aha moment. You guys ever had an aha moment about anything in your life where like something clicks and you get it. You're like, ah, now I know why that happens. Now I understand how that works. Now it's like, sometimes you just do things to do things because that's, that's how they've been done or that's how you were told to do them. So you're just going to do them. But when it clicks and you get it, that aha moment, now you know the why behind what you're doing. Now you can teach that to somebody else because you have under standing. And that's, that's that, that word revelation. So remember, well, hopefully there's an aha moment here. The seed has all the power. The seed has all the ability. The seeds, seeds contain everything they need for life. It's all in the seed. They have the programming. They know what they're supposed to do, and they're going to do it. If they are cared for properly, they're going to do what they're supposed to do. The seed is complete. The seed is perfect. It just needs good soil. You guys, Jesus is the seed. 
He's talking about himself, and he's talking about how he is received by people. He's talking about the soil of our hearts, what happens in our lives when we hear about him and how we respond to him. That's what this parable is all about. And Jesus wants us to get it. He wants his people, his church, to get it. He wants it to click, because once it clicks, we move from going through the motions to having that revelation, to having that understanding of why we're doing things. And it's not just understanding, it's understanding with power. Uh, when, when, when you have understanding the aha moment, the revelation, that helps us to build our lives on him consistently. And then we begin to see that 160 and 30 fold fruit in our life. So what I want to talk about today is what keeps us from understanding. <laughs> like what in the world is standing in the way of us understanding all that Jesus wants to do in our life, his seed in our life. So what keeps us from understanding? Number one, I'm going to give you three points today. And there are three points that Jesus already gave you. So they, they're in there. He did a three-point message when he spoke this to the crowds of people. Number one, you can write this down. The enemy comes and steals what God told us. The first thing that happens is the enemy steals what God told us, and that keeps us from understanding. Verse 19 says, when anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. So let's say God says something to you. God speaks and he starts drawing you. Last week we had baptisms at the 11 a.m. service, so maybe you were here for that and you're dancing around the fence of salvation and Jesus and what that means. And when you saw that, you, you kind of leaned in a little bit. You felt like the Lord was speaking to you and you're, you're kind of assessing your life going, this has been my life without Jesus and I'm kind of leaning into this. What would my life look like with him? And you sense the Lord kind of drawing you near. You, maybe you wouldn't say it was the Lord. You just have this feeling, this sense, I want that. Whatever that is, is good. I can't define it, but I want that. And so you sense yourself inching closer on the inside and maybe even on the outside. Maybe maybe you're bold enough to, to raise your hand to, to pray the prayer that says, yeah, I'm choosing Jesus. Or maybe you check the box on a connection card or you wrote out a prayer request, like you're taking steps towards Jesus. But there's a little fear or hesitation or uncertainty also in the mix. Because you do sense that God is drawing you or you sense something good in this direction, but you can't quite define the fear or the anxiety. And what it is, is it's the enemy trying to steal the seed of Jesus as it's being planted in your life. And so what happens is you get in an environment like this. You get in a, in a worship environment where, you know, we're singing songs and people are raising their hands and you're like, I don't totally understand what's going on here, but whatever this is seems, seems good. It seems powerful. There's something, there's something intangible going on here. And it's, a, it's an environment where the seed is able to grow. You're in an environment that is good for your soil. It's, it's making space for that seed to grow. It's a healthy environment for the seed to thrive. And the soil of your heart becomes receptive to what it is that God is saying to you. And even just two hours after walking away, the enemy will whisper to you in your own voice, in your own thoughts, and say, that was just emotion. You were just feeling, you just got real emotional. You were just feeling it. It was just hype in the room. The enemy will come immediately and start telling you stuff. He'll say, that wasn't real. You can even pray a prayer. You can be one of the people who raise your hands, you pray a prayer, and the enemy will say to you, say to you later, you know what? You're a fake you're a fake. You didn't really mean that. You just did that because you felt pressure in the room. That is the enemy strategy. And you veterans of the faith, I'm talking to veterans of the faith now, you guys know this. You know what that's like because the seed of Jesus isn't just about salvation. The seed of Jesus holds the potential for more than just salvation. It holds the potential for faith. It holds the potential for belief. It holds the potential for wisdom. It holds the potential for healing and for reconciliation. And you veterans know this. You have been in soil enriched environments where you feel like you're, you're being invested in. Your faith is growing. It's good for your soil. You're beginning to believe God for more things. You're beginning to think that you can ask the Lord for things. You can begin to make some changes in your life. And you walked away encouraged. But middle of the week, you, veterans of the faith, we veterans of the faith, still have to battle through whether or not that was real or just emotion. Come on, how many of you guys have been there? Veterans, you know that. You have been encouraged. And then you've had to fight through it in the middle of the week. That's the enemy 
enemy's strategy. And you know why he, come, he has to come right away? And you know why he has to come right away? Because if that seed takes root at all, it will grow. <laughs> It'll grow. It's made to. If the seed takes root at all, it grows. And so if you truly receive Jesus and you have that aha moment, you won't trade him in for anything. No, 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 no. You won't trade. Why? Because he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He has abundant life and he will start producing fruit in your life. And it will seem as if you didn't even have to try like things you've been trying for ages or weeks to overcome and to get rid of, to deal with. As soon as you have an aha moment with Jesus, it's like, there's peace over that situation. There's peace over that thing. There's understanding. As soon as the seed takes root, it starts to, you can't stop it. It's made to. Jesus is made to grow in our life. That's, that's what he's saying to us. If Jesus gets in your soil, he's going to start producing change in you. You're not going to be able to go to that party anymore and have the same kind of fun that you used to. You know, you're not going to be able to enjoy that makeout session plus more as much as you used to. Like he's getting in your soil and he's kind of messing your life up, but it's good. It's a good mess up. This is what you've been praying for. This is what you've been asking for. But he is, he's disturbing it. You know, like he's getting in there. You're not going to be able to enjoy that weekend away where whatever happens in wherever stays in wherever. Like he's going to be in the back of your mind. It's it's not the same. You're not going to be able to enjoy like, you know, when you just get in there and you slam your boss or you slam that other employee. Like, it's not so much fun anymore. There's a little bit more guilt. Like, I didn't used to feel guilty before. Now, this, I don't, what is this? It's Jesus. He started taking root in your life and he's growing. He's growing you up. So he's going to come in. If, as, if it takes any root at all, he, he gets in there and he starts taking over the garden of your life. And it'll be a little bit strange at first. <laughs> but good strange, you know, good strange. So the enemy comes really quick and he tries to get that seed not to land in the good soil, but instead he wants, he sweeps it over into the hard path because we've all got hard places in our life. There's biases. There are things we've been told about the church, about people, about Jesus. The enemy will remind us of some dumb hurt from the past. Like he'll anything and everything. He'll try and get the seed to land in that hard path and not the good soil enriching environment. So what do you do? That's great. Like the enemy's doing this. Jesus is doing this. Like, am I just a pawn in the middle of it? <laughs> no. What do you do to keep that good seed from being stolen from you? Because you can keep it. You can decide you're not stealing this from me. I'm going to give you some action steps. You got to get the word of God into you. You have to get the word of God into you. And that's, that's on, that's on you. <laughs> you know, you got to, you have to create space. You have to read the word of God and ask him for understanding. Ask him for revelation. And when I say revelation, I'm not talking about some new and strange teaching that's tickling to your ears and is like, guess what? And you're going to start some new weird sect of Christianity. That's not what I'm talking about when I say revelation. I mean Biblical understanding. Ask the Lord to reveal his heart to you through his word. What did you mean when you said this? And what does that look like in my life? And I promise you, if you ask, he's going to answer and he's going to start bringing understanding to you. You got to get the word of God into your family habits. You have to get the word of God into your workplace routine. If you don't sit down and read one scripture a day with your, your, with your family or with your kids, start it. Is it going to be weird? Are your kids going to hate it? Are you going to think it's weird and maybe hate it? Probably. Probably. I read with my kids and sometimes it's awkward. You know, like I get in weird mom voice. What? Just be normal. You know, like what is mom voice? Everybody, I hate it. Ugh. it but you got to start somewhere. Get the word of God into your family habits. Get it into your workplace routine. I don't care how weird it is. If you're giving your life to Christ and you want to grow in the word, start a Bible study on your lunch break. Like, hey, I'm going to, don't make it weird. Don't make it weird. That's what we do. We get all weird. Our voice changes. We get all serious and like professional. Just be normal, you know? And just say, hey, I'm going to read the Bible at lunch. I don't know if that's weird to you or not, but if you want to, just come sit with me and let's talk about it. Like, don't be weird, but get it into your life. If you spend time with your family, if you spend time at work, get the word of God into those places. Don't let the enemy steal it in the middle of the week because there's a lot of people hanging around the things of God, hanging around the places where the seed is, but allowing that the enemy to blow the seed over into those hard places rather than creating a place where it's going to land in good soil. So there's people hanging around the things of God, but people aren't showing any fruit for it. 
We don't want to be fruitless people. I don't want to like have the appearance of godliness, but being void of its power. I want the full power of God alive and active in my life. That's what changes the world. That's what changes me. That's what changes my family. So I've got to create the environment. And then another thing you can do is remember your story. Remember your story. Remember the moment you met. If you've already met Jesus, go back and remember that. Remember the power of that moment. Remember the power of his presence and ask, Lord, would you do that again in me? Would I have that same fire, that same passion? I'm older now and I'm more mature now and I'm away from that, but I don't want to lose that fire, that passion that you first put in me. Remember your story. Maybe you didn't fully know what it meant when you raised your hand and said, yeah, I want to make you Lord of my life. But I would say to you, go back and say, make room again for that seed and its implications in your life. If I made you Lord of my life and I remember there was a moment, Jesus, would you help me to understand more what that means so I can live it out? 2 Timothy 2, there's a scripture for this one. 2 Timothy 2, 25 and 26 says this. Uh, Paul is writing to Timothy who's pastoring a church and he says, gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth maybe as we're talking about this, you know people who are deceived. You're like, man, they're so deceived that they would just get it. <laughs> gently, gently instruct is what he says, okay? Um, how do you protect against destruction in your life or in the life of someone else? It's but by the grace of God. The, the, the way that we're able to gently instruct other people is because we have recognized the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy of God in our own life. So as you think about your story, as you think about your stupidity, as you think about all those moments in time where you acted in ignorance and the Lord came and he forgave you and he has grown you up and he has forgiven you and he has shaped you, you remember those moments of grace and forgiveness and then you look over and say, oh, that's what they need. <laughs> they need grace and they need forgiveness. When you have someone who's deceived, show them more love. Show them more grace. Because he says, perhaps God will change those people's hearts. How is he going to change those people's hearts? Because you gently instructed those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change their hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses. The Bible says when you get deceived, you have no sense. And so we gently instruct and it brings understanding back into the hearts and lives of people. And then they will escape from the devil's trap. So the second thing is we give up when we face trouble or we get offended. We give up when we face trouble or get offended. Verse 20 says, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word... <laughs> Because of the word, they quickly fall away. So I just, for a moment, the people that Jesus was originally talking to in its, in its original context, these were people who could be cut off from their families and cut off from their entire support systems if they decided to follow him. They would have been kicked out of the temple. They would have been kicked out of their families. That's who he's talking to first. The worst of the persecution for choosing Jesus, for letting his seed take root in their life, would have come from those closest to them. It would have come from their moms and their dads and their brothers and their sisters and their aunts and their cousins. They would have been excommunicated from their families if their families didn't also choose Jesus. It was a big deal. And so maybe you have experienced that. You know what it feels like to choose Jesus and be cut off from everybody else. Or, or... Maybe you were deceived and you picked up a bias from someone that says when you make Jesus Lord of your life, everything becomes easier and lighter. So the moment something difficult happens, you question your faith. You question whether or not Jesus is good and you need to invest any more time in developing that relationship. Jesus says when that pressure, when that persecution, when that trouble comes, the seed that was first received with joy gets choked out. In other translations, it says that people get offended. <laughs> ah! So what happens is instead of us recognizing offense as a weed, we receive it as something that belongs in our life. And what we do is we start watering it. We start feeding it. We start giving time and attention to it. And that's all we focus on. We focus only on that offense and we starve out the seed of Jesus. We do it. We do it because we don't recognize offense as a trap. It's a trap. It's a trick of the enemy. So what do you 
do to keep the seed of Jesus from staying shallow and getting blown away from your life? I'm going to give you some action steps. You got to get some roots. <laughs> you have to get some roots. You, and when I say you have to get roots, this is what I mean. You have to know, and so I'm telling you if you haven't heard this before, you have to know that difficult things are going to come at you. And you have to know, this is the bigger one, you have to know that Jesus as Lord of your life is going to offend you. Jesus, as Lord of your life, is going to make you angry. Jesus, as Lord of your life, is going to make you frustrated. <laughs> and I'm going to get there because our sins are forgiven. When we choose Jesus, our sins are forgiven. But then it says we're being sanctified. Sanctified. You know what sanctified is? It's a huge word, whatever. That means he's forgiven our sins, but he's still dealing with our sin nature. Our sin nature doesn't go away. Our sins are forgiven, but he's got to work out our sin nature. And your sin nature, our sin nature is offended by Jesus. They're at war with each other. My sin nature hates Jesus. Jesus had to come die on the cross and love me first so that I, through, I would overcome my sin nature and choose him in the first place. So Jesus, in your life, he's going to offend you. He is going to offend your emotions. He is going to offend your thoughts. He is going to offend your plans. And so you cannot fall away when the Lord of your life <laughs> is trying to do something in you. You can go the opposite direction, but getting roots means understanding that. You have to know that your church is going to let you down. If Lifeline is your church, you have to know that your church is going to let you down. Why? Because we're people. And you know what? We let ourselves down. If we let ourselves down, you better believe we're going to let you down. Not on purpose, not intentionally. We're just people. We all have unrealistic expectations that don't get met. We have expectations we don't communicate. And then they don't get met. And then we get angry and we won't talk to anybody about it. We just think they're supposed to know it. And so we get angry and we disappear and we think we're punishing them. No, you've fallen into a trap of the enemy. And you are going to choke out the word of Jesus. Jesus in your life. Come on, people. We need roots. We got to take some accountability for what the Lord is doing in our life. Can I tell you that Pastor Elliot and I are going to let you down? Every single time we've gone on vacation, someone's died. Every single time. We've been pastors for 12 years. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're going on vacation in June. What I'm saying is. <laughs> I'm serious. We're not going to be there to perform that memorial service. We're not going to be there to perform that celebration of life. We're not going to be there to go to the hospital when you really need us to sometimes. We're going to let you down. There's going to be moments when we're gone. And if you're, if you're not careful, you will pick up the trap and become offended by that and starve out what Jesus wants to do in your life. Come on. We're not Lord of your life. He is. We've got to get some roots. We've got to deal with the fence. We've got to see it and know it and call it what it is and get it out. It's a weed. You don't want it. Growth-oriented people, which is my heart for Lifeline Church, my heart for Lifeline Church is that we're growth-oriented people. And growth-oriented people don't have time to get offended because they're too busy growing. They're too busy tending to the soil. They're too busy looking at the garden. And because they're doing that, they recognize offense. They recognize offense as weeds. They see the weeds for what they are, and they don't let them take root. And if they have taken root, they don't just rip them off from the top, but they get down in there with a dumb shovel, and they get all the way under the root, and they get it out of their life. Growth-oriented people don't have time to be offended. Deal with it. If somebody offended you, deal with it. That doesn't mean talk to somebody else about it. It means talk to a trusted person person who's going to tell you the right thing to do and then do the hard stuff and get it done. Get it done because we want 160 and 30 fold fruit in my life. Amen. Woo. Okay. Number three. And I don't just mean with your church. I'm talking about your in-laws. Your in-laws are going to offend you. Don't. Blah. You don't have a hundred fold fruit in your marriage if you're offended at your in-laws. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't have a hundredfold fruit at your workplace if you're offended with your boss. Deal with it in every space of life, not just the church. Okay, number three. We get consumed by other things or deceived by money. We get consumed by other things or deceived by money. Verse 22, the seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word of God, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. So Jesus is saying there's a choking effect when we get off course. At one time, 
there's in a different parable, Jesus is talking to a large crowd of people who's up on the hillside, and there's the water around them and the trees and the plants, and that gives a beautiful scenery when, when you when you read that part portion of scripture. And the crowd that he's talking to, they are consumed with the future. They are consumed with how things are going to work out and, and what's going to happen and what the world looks like and how they're going to navigate it and what's going to happen with their kids. They're consumed with the worries of the world that are right in front of them. And Jesus says to them, this is when he makes that famous quote that you hear all the time in church, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will take care of itself. That was a calibrating statement that Jesus made. Is it, calibrate your life. Get back on <laughs> video games. You know, you got the Wii. Anybody ever had the Wii? You got to put it upside down. Like when it gets like, why isn't it working? You know, like you're pushing the buttons and you're way over here on the screen. It doesn't make any sense. You got to calibrate the remote. You got to flip it upside down, leave it alone on the table, calibrate. And then you can pick it back up and you can play the game again. In life, you got to calibrate yourself. You got to set your life down get it calibrated, balanced with Jesus, and then you pick it back up and you keep moving. You can't go way over here or way over here. That was a calibrating statement Jesus said to them. Seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will take care of itself. What he's saying is let that seed grow. Let my seed grow in your life. Tend to the soil of your heart regarding my seed in your life. Do that first. Consider that first. Consider me first, and everything else will begin to settle into place. What happens is we think self-preservation. We need another person to preserve us. We need some kind of external force to ensure my security and provision. No, 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 no. Seek this kingdom seed first. Focus on that. Focus on my words to you, and I will take care of you. And Jesus says, the worries of this world choke the seed. He doesn't, I want you to hear me, he doesn't say that money chokes the seed. He says it's the deception or the worry over money that chokes the seed. Why? Because when we start to worry about money, we give all of our time and attention to it. Like, I need to work more. I need to do this. I need to do this. Like, all of our time and attention gets diverted to money. And he says that chokes the seed because you can't give full attention to two things. <laughs> you can't. I'm a mom. I try. And then I just get angry and blow up. You know, like you can't. At some point, it will destroy you. And so he doesn't say that money's the enemy. He says, worrying over that and caring about that more than you care about me and serving that above me is going to choke out my seed in your life. And this is, this is huge. Jesus say it's not that Jesus says those things don't grow. Jesus says they grow so big that they take over. I don't want those taken over in my life. You don't want those things taken over in your life. So what do we do? What do we do? Again, some action steps. We have to assess what we are giving our time, our attention, and our resources to. So I'm, gonna, I'm not getting in your business. You're going to get in your own business, but I'm going to lead you through some questions. <laughs> How much time are you spending caring for the soil of your heart towards Jesus? How much time do you spend thinking about him? How much time do you spend wondering what it is that he says about the situation? How much time are you spending in the word of God, reading it and seeking to understand what it's saying and have it speak to you? I'm gonna be gentle, but is it just this, the scripture of the day for five minutes? Is it just the scripture of the day that pops up on your app and you're interacting with that and that's it for the day? That's a great place to start. I'm not saying it's not a good thing to do. But five minutes a day in the entirety of your week isn't enough to care for the soil. So start there, absolutely. But then ask the Lord, where, where else can I make space for that? How, how else can I interact with you? How much time are you spending with some worship music on? fixing your eyes on Jesus and bowing down before him in your heart. How much time on your own are you doing that? Is it, again, I'm going to be gentle, but is it just the 20 minutes on a Sunday morning where you come in here and honestly, for the first 10 minutes, you're worried about who's around you and if you should lift your hands up? Like, <laughs> again, a great place to start. It's a great place to start. We've got to get comfortable, but at some point, we got to take what Jesus is saying to us and we got to make room for it in our own life. We're accountable for what we do with it. If we want a hundredfold fruit in our life, am I making room for a hundred? Do I have a hundredfold soil? 
what am I doing with it? How much time are you spending in conversation with Jesus, telling him your needs, not just thinking about your needs, but telling him your needs and handing over your worries? Are you just carrying your worries and thinking about them? Are you like, oh, Jesus, I'm worried about, like, are you trying to engage him in that conversation? Again, I'm going to be gentle, but is it just when you're angry at something you don't have? And then, you, then, then we turn to the Lord. These are, these are habits. These are tricks of the enemy. And we can overcome them. How much time are you spending with the body of Christ, the people of God, being strengthened and encouraged? <laughs> Gentle. Is it just on Sunday morning when you sit in a row next to people who you never interact with outside of that? Again, I, I'm being gentle because remember, when a seedling is first planted, if it's planted inside and it's, it's never given a, a chance to get strengthened, it's never given a chance to, to get some resistance, and it gets moved outside, it will die. It won't live. It won't bear good fruit. It will be crushed by the frost. It will be crushed by the wind. It will be crushed by the rain. And so I'm, I'm gently trying to brush some seedlings in our life. Where are the places where we need to fortify and become strengthened? Where are the places where we need to develop some resistance? And those are great ways to do it. We call it the first 15. And it's a great place to start. I don't, I'm don't. i not saying live there because 20 years of being a Christian, you better be spending more than 15 minutes a day with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great place to start. The first 15 is you're going to, you spend five minutes in the word, reading the word of God. You spend five minutes in worship, bowing down in your heart, remembering that he's Lord of your life. And then you spend five minutes in prayer, giving him your day and saying, Lord, use me today. I belong to you in all the places that I'm going to be. You start your day with that and then you build from there. I'm going to leave you with this encouraging word. <laughs> Receptive hearts and God's seed always produce fruit. Receptive hearts and God's seed always produce fruit. And so I say to you, as I look around the room, I know we have receptive hearts in this place. I know we have hearts who are leaning in to the things of God. Whether it's for salvation to take place or it's for faith to take place, there are seeds and receptive hearts where the Lord is doing a work in our life. And I believe that. And so I want you to be encouraged. God is at work in your life. He's moving things around and it's good strange, which is why you're uncomfortable in some situations and so lean into that don't run away from it but lean in and ask the Lord Lord what are you doing here and how do I do this more can we pray let's go ahead and bow your heads and close your eyes I'd love to just pray for us father I thank you so much for your son Jesus and I thank you that that Jesus is the seed and he has everything we need. He has all the potential. He has all the growth. He has all the power. And your desire is that the seed of your son Jesus would be planted in our lives in such a way that, that he lives in us and he takes over and it's a good takeover. That we have assurance, that we have peace, that we have security, that we are at rest, that we can handle and weather the storms of life because we are strengthened and fortified. I thank you, Father, that your word to us and, and Jesus in us is stronger and greater than offense. Lord, I thank you that Jesus in us is able to overcome the tricks and the tactics of the enemy. I thank you for your word that brings us wisdom. And I thank you that Jesus, when he was here, took the time to explain it so that we, thousands of years later, can benefit from his word and from his time. You are so good, God. I ask that you would move upon our hearts to make our hearts more and more receptive to what it is that you're saying and what it is that you're doing. Lord, I ask that more and more we would have our hearts open to you to lay down the things that are standing in the way. Father, as we hear your word spoken to us, we wouldn't hold on to anger. We wouldn't hold on to bitterness. We wouldn't hold on to bias, but we would recognize it and say, if that can be gone in my life, I want it to be gone in my life. Would you help me on that process? I thank you, Jesus. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to give you an opportunity. If you've been dancing around salvation, but you haven't made Jesus Lord of your life and you want that because you want a hundredfold fruit in your life, I want to give you that opportunity. And I also want to give you an opportunity if you feel like there, there was a time where you gave your life to the Lord and there was excitement, there was joy. But as we're going through this series, you're recognizing that some of the things of God have been choked out in your life. 
Some of the things of God have been put on the hard path and the enemy tried to steal them for you and you're saying, I want that back. I want that back and I want good soil. If that's you, would you just lift your hand into the air because I want to pray with you. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen, I see you. Amen, amen. Woo, God is on the move and it is good. Can I give you some encouragement? The moment you raised your hand, God started to work. Would you just begin to receive what God wants to do in your heart and in your life? Would you begin to believe with faith that my God is already on the move? He's already moving those things. And then let's pray. Church, would you pray with me? Father God, God, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you for his power. I thank you for his forgiveness. I want you to talk to Jesus. Jesus, I repent of my sin. I confess that I have gone against you. And I submit that to you. Would you take that away from me and make me new? Like your word says, I am restored, I am healed, I am made new, and I want to walk in that. Fill me with your spirit to remind me of what you have spoken and infuse me with your power. In Jesus' name, amen.